All right, let's start. Uh, any questions? Yeah? I didn't really understand what uh, all these P underscore T underscore. Oh, yeah, I'm going to show you now what they are. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, let me put this in here. Sorry. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, <clears throat> Well, let's go to an example. So this is the GitHub repository of the Grid Tools project. Go to the examples. Interface one. <coughs> so, you, if you. Uh, if you, if you uh, have heard about C++, you probably have heard about the boilerplate code, which is a code that is there and it's annoying everybody, and, but it, it must be there. We are not uh, uh, free from that. We, still, we have some boilerplate code, and I'm showing you some of this. Uh, Okay, here we will see all the conventions that Peter said are basically broken, almost. Uh, yeah. But the important thing is that he would not know, and I would not give him the link to the video, so it's okay. But um, So here we have our Laplacian function, exactly as I was showing. The only thing here is the difference in the x lap instead of x region. But the two fluxes, similar thing. The output function, similar thing. Here we have some experiment, uh, some other APIs that we can play with. But uh, let's go to the main. We don't have a main here. We have a test. I think Peter will be proud of me um, because this is you can use it is as example as a unit test as a benchmark the same code so you don't replicate and okay um, so first of all you need to uh, select the backend and we use uh, in this example we use uh, guards we use um, um, macros and we say backend CUDA with blocks can host with a, with a block or naive implementations, uh, different backends. <coughs> Sorry. Here there is a line in which we take the storage type. So where do we want to store data? So this example doesn't show it very well, actually. We need to improve this example. But the storage type is, is obtained by the backend. So you say backend column column storage type. What is the storage type I need to use for you backend? So this is an important thing we'll cover later on in another when I talk about uh, Cocos library. But the, the, the memory data structure, the memory layout is extremely important and it's uh, fundamental to get performance uh, on different, uh, f for a specific architecture. So on the host you want a layout which is C-like then on the GPU, you want a layout which is Fortran-like. So the stride one in the first dimension for GPUs, or the stride one for the last dimension in the case of the host. Um, I have no time to go into why this is, this, this is so, but it's important to be able to have both things in the same, t the same time. So the storage type would say, backend, what, what storage do you want me to use? and what storage type you want me to use. And then you do the init fields. Now, this is because you're using this repository. But basically, you instantiate an object of a certain storage type, and you put your data in. And then here we have only three, st 
storages, the input, the output, and the coefficients. <coughs> I didn't show the coefficients in the, in the slides. It's another field used in this computation. So there are three data fields that I need to go in and out. But there are actually six data fields that, I, that I'm logically using, which are the results of the Laplacian computation and the results of the two fluxes. But those are not really storages. We will not store those things. We are not interested in, in those values. We don't care about those values. So we, we will discard those values at the end of the computation. And so we need to, to say, OK, the Laplacian is actually temporary storage type. And so the fluxes. And, and, but the actual coefficient and input output are really storage types. What are these things? Those are placeholders. This guy is basically an empty class. It is it's just simply empty class with, um, with two template arguments. One is an integer, and the other one is a storage type, as you can see. The index is used to identify the placeholder. The placeholder name is like the first placeholder, the second placeholder. Then we give names to these guys. So PLAP is the first placeholder, PIN is the fourth, and so on. Another boilerplate here. We need to put all our placeholders. It doesn't matter in which order you put them. Just put it in order so you're safer. The, the code should, should do the sorting, you know, but... Yeah. Uh, it is an MPL vector. What is MPL? MPL is a library, a metaprogramming library from Boost. Boost MPL vector is a vector of types. Okay? In fact, it's a type def. Type def, accessor list. So this thing is not a variable, it's not a value, it's a type. And it's a type encoding containing these other types in there. You see also these placeholders are type defs. They're not variables, they're not values, they're types. <clears throat> so, if def, as we like to do, okay, let's go to the C11 version. Now, at some point, we need to, to create, to tell the library what are the real storages. We have instantiated the storages somewhere, and we need to give we need to associate placeholders with storages, and we do it this way. We say p out. What is p out? Open and close. Is default construction. We should use curly brackets. This code works also for C plus plus O three, not only C plus plus eleven. This is why, but this is only C plus plus enabled, so we should use curly brackets anyway. <laughs> Another rule broken. <laughs> I like to break rules, so. P out, default constructed, is equal to out. And out is the storage, is the storage class, storage object. Uh, P in is in, and P coef is coef. Now, default constructed, there is an overload of the assignment operator, which returns something that represents the binding between the placeholder and the storage. This is also an, an example in which semantic Semantics is broken. If you, if you listen to Peter, which is very good advices, I'll, I force you to, do, to follow his advices. But when you overload the assignment operator, you should somehow assign. This is not doing so. This is generating an object. Which, this assignment operator is returning an object, which is passed to this domain object, this domain type with, with the accessor list, which is there, which tells how to assign the storage class to the placeholder. Here we have the interface for telling how, how big the grid is. OK, I'm not going into the detail of this, because there, there's something more subtle things in there you can do. But you basically tell how, how big the grid is. Then you have some puppy event, always useful. Oh, look at this, another rule broken. So this code works also for C++03. 
We didn't have auto at that time. The sad old times, so we didn't have auto. So instead, what we do, we have a computation type, which is an abstract class with virtual methods uh, from which the intermediate representation inherits from. But it's okay to do it here because this is a high level thing. So you just you pay a NIF for each stencil, which is not a big deal. Actually, it's nothing. So you, but in C11, you want to do auto horizontal diffusion equal and get the actual object. So you have the make computation, the backend, you get the caches, the execute. This is forward instead of parallel. It's, uh, <coughs> uh, you have the Laplacian, and here you have the placeholders again. They show up again. They are default constructed placeholders. You just use the track dependencies and map the arguments of the functors of the function of the stencil function to the actual storages or to the temporaries. And from here we create the dependency. And then you do horizontal diffusion ready, horizontal diffusion steady, and can you guess what the final step is? Where is it? I lost it. Ah, it's run. Bad API design. We need to fix this. Anyway, ready instantiate the temporaries or instantiate all the all, all the uh, properties that we need to instantiate it before starting a computation steady prepares the data so if it needs to move data to the gpu we will need we will need move the data to the gpu and then you can run multiple times without touching the data anymore I mean, without without moving data back and forth so this uh, run is done several in several steps and we have a, a flusher, uh, which is just to flush the cache in order to be able to perform fair benchmarks. So when we start the new iteration, the cache is fresh, and we can measure the time in a fair way, because we don't want to cheat. <clears throat> All right? <coughs> what is this? Uh, th those are makers. So make it, the function, and the placeholders. How does it look like? Do I have it here? No, I don't have it here. Uh, OK, I'll show you this later. Uh, we are in the examples, we go into include, the stencil composition part, uh, structure grids, make ESF C11. So when you make ESF stand for elementary stencil function, bad name will fix it. And this is what it does make ESF will take the placeholders the default constructed placeholders, which we care only about the names, sorry, sort of only about the types, not about the values, just the types. So we, we comment out the name of the variables, we just care about the types, and we put, we have a function returning an elementary stencil function descriptor, which has the function name plus a vector of the placeholders. An MPL vector, still, it's not just a type with a list of things. And it does return the default constructed ESF descriptor. Why do you need to default construct it just to get the type of it through a return statement? But this is an empty function, the compiler will throw it away. So we don't see this function at the end. It will be, so if you compile with dash 0, you actually see it. If you compile with dash 3, this goes away completely. You don't see it. The second specialization oh, is for the staggering keyword. I'm not going into that. But basically, yep. <coughs> Where's the mic? Okay. 
why the double ampersand in extra uh, argus? Just to be because, fancy. Because it's, it's type um, name. Uh, it, it's, uh, so you want to use the double ampersand for temporary objects. So doing this, you, you force the user to pass the placeholder as the fold constructed in the function call. I'll show you this. I don't know if it is a good idea. I like the idea, but I don't know if it is a good idea. Um, because uh, I draw, no, where is it? Where is it? So examples, oh, too many folders. Examples. Interface one. Okay. Here, this is the default constructed, default constructed placeholder. This is a temporary object. Right? This is just created on the fly. If I was creating a variable of this type, so p out x semicolon, and I would write x here, that thing wouldn't work. Because it's not a temporary object. So it's just to have this to enforce to get the user to write with the placeholders here so you can see the data dependencies. Uh, why do you want the user to pass in a temporary? Why can't they pass in a reference to an actual instance? <coughs> um, because I'm a fascist? No. Um, I think it will make more error prone if you allow passing uh, other, other objects. I mean, named objects. Uh, because this I know p out, well, p in here is the same pin in here is the same pin in there. There's no way these two guys can be different, and I see it. If I this, if I if I instantiate object with those names in whatever names I want, and I put it there, I lose track. I cannot read the code and say, oh, these are the data dependencies. You need to go where the type is and try to understand if they are the right ones or not. So by enforcing this, you just have to use the placeholders there. I think it's a good design. Uh, let's see. <coughs> so uh, the make computation. Ah, just to just to show you very very quickly the um, what happened if you. Don't use C++ 11, just to scare you a little bit. Make ESF C++ 03. That's it. It doesn't have the staggered implementation, not supported for non C++ 11. Can you read it? Only a few people can think that knows the boost preprocessor library. Uh, so once you know that library is not so difficult to read, it's still difficult to read, but C++11 with, with variadic templates, just pure, pure C++ line. This is a macro. Define, make, yourself, and stuff. So C++03 didn't have variadic templates. So you need to instantiate one version of the function with one argument, one version with two arguments, one version with three arguments, four arguments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes you still need to do something like this. You know, variadics don't solve all the problems, but uh, the, the C++ 11 version is definitely better. So is this 34 to 38? Okay. Am I, am I done? Uh, I don't remember. <coughs> ah, um, what time is it? Uh, ba -ba -ba -bum. Uh, 
Okay, um, and try. Uh, um, there's the uh, tuple examples, um, which use a const expert uh, thing to construct to compute stuff on uh, on the fly at compilation time. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I, if I have time, I show you some of the code. Um, but I don't know if I have time to do it. But basically, in 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 the G, uh, in, in the grid tools, you can have this syntax, right? When you do the offsets like this, which which I find quite intuitive and nice, but somebody else comes in and says, ah, you, there are better ways of doing it, and so we say I plus one and J plus one, where I is just an index of uh, that guy, dimension one. Uh, the first dimension is i, the second dimension is j, and you do i plus one, j plus one, and those are not, those are compiled time evaluations. Those are compiled, uh, evaluated at compiled time, and uh, it, it's a very interesting mechanism to, to do compiled time tuple expansions. It, it's uh, uh, quite rich, but I don't have probably the time to show it to you. Yes? Why do you need the accessor information at the top? Because you could also calculate that with... <coughs> okay. Um, this evaluation object is... Um, I think it's a boost fusion vector at the moment, or something like this. It, it's just a, a tuple of uh, different, with, with the, uh, different uh, types, with different pointers to actual storages. So they, they, they encode where I am in my iteration in terms of pointers, so pointing to a point in space. Um, and I need to get, so this is a list. And I'm going to say, well, accessor out is the first one as index zero. So whenever I do out zero, eval out zero, an eval of this type, it will go to the first element of that tuple, get the pointer, compute the offset if there is an offset, and get the value back. Or in this case, actually, a reference where you assign to. Um, so I need the accessor information to know which field uh, I could use. Um, this, uh, uh, this came out of a long uh, discussion and how, how we could do this in a, in a short way, in a very compact way. And this is the best solution we have found. Um, <clears throat> but that's why we need the range information. Actually, uh, sorry, the uh, asset store. And also the range information, for instance, there, up there, there is a range of minus one, one, which uh, we tell how big the, the axis is. It actually can be inferred from these guys. This is redundant, computa redundant information, potentially dangerous, because you can make a mistake. You can you can write a plus two here and leave it one there, and this will lead you to uh, hopefully to a compile time error in this case, but it will give you troubles. The problem is that we cannot infer what's happening inside the function. C++ doesn't have enough introspection to get at compile time those values, so we need to get those values explicitly somewhere. Those are the trade-offs. The, the, the ideal world versus the real world, and you need to find compromises. Okay, we covered this. The make yourself. Let's go and see when we run. Where is it? Oh no, sorry, wrong screen. Uh, so when we run, <coughs> C++ 
strategy is the can trades. Uh, okay, let's go back. All right. It's intermediate, intermediate step, the one that translates the user code to the intermediate representation. This is the same code for basically every kind of grids we could possibly have. So it's very uh, good uh, reuse. And if we go to, all right, 129, quite complicated stuff. We have the ready function, the steady function, and the run. The ready is uh, preparing temporaries. It's asking the backend, prepare the temporaries. I'm going to start the computation. The steady says, OK, if the storage is ready, now you can prepare it. So if I have data on the host that need to be moved there, that's the right moment to do it. And then there is the run. Okay, the run method, you should focus on the, this one, in which you pass the grid, which is the sizes of your domain, plus the list uh, of arguments to be passed to each, uh, to each functor, to each stencil functor, uh, stencil operator. And uh, there is a matter start, a matter pose, these methods turns out to be empty functions if you don't need to uh, take times, otherwise they will take the times. And, and this MSS uh, components array is basically a trait class with all the information you need to pass. How is this computed? It's not computed really at runtime, it's computed at compile time. And it's done up here. So the intermediate take uh, the multi multi-stage stencil description, which is an array of arrays, an array of stencils with an array of, uh, inside of which there is an array of uh, elementary stencil functions, and within each of those there is, there is an array of uh, uh, placeholders. There are all types. <coughs> mm. Then you have a lot of meta functions. So from the MSS description, from the description, we can extract something. And just to show you how the code looks like, I'm not going to explain you what it is. You take an MPL vector and you iterate over it, applying some meta function to it, and get another type out of it. This is a function that extracts the extents from the functors. Okay. And you have another meta function that gives you the components array that given to the run. You have a, a, some argument list and, and many other meta functions. So all, every time you see column column type, that is a meta function. You pass something to it, you get a new type out of it. You create a new type out of these things. It takes uh, some. Uh, it takes some time to digest these things usually, but uh, not really long, I would say. The backend. Let's see another rule broken. I say when you have a, a specialization, when you have template specializations, put all the specialization in a single file. That's a rule that works very well if you are running, uh, if you're writing an STL-like library. Uh, it doesn't work well in this case, in which the backend is actually a specialization of some abstract, some empty class somewhere, and that specialization had better be in a, in a in a in a folder by itself in files that are only. Uh, uh, they are only known to that software component, but it is a specialization, so it's breaking one of one of the rules. And uh, let's see if we can get to it. Uh, well, probably not very interesting. The backend is uh, again. So the 
Backend is a very simple class. Lot of documentation, but not much. <coughs> Sorry. It, it takes a, a backend ID, host or GPU or whatever else. It takes a strategy ID, and then go from the traits. The same thing I showed you before. There's a traits class when you get the backend traits. And from the backend traits, you get what strategy am I using? Uh, what, um, uh, how many threads uh, I'm going to use, or how many threads in the I direction or the J direction. Uh, regarding the strategy, why do you need to access the traits? Because the strategy is an enum type. Uh, this has, um, well, the threads depends on where you're running, so we want to, custom, to, want to be ready to run on different number of cores. Uh, without recompiling. So that is the runtime information you get. Okay. It is possible to compile uh, an application for a fixed number of threads. It becomes a little bit too rigid, a little bit, you know, uh, we need some more flexibility. Just after a while, you go and do a lot of stuff, and you create a lot of trades, and pass other trades. It's a quite long chain of stuff. At the end, you get to the strategy, which implements something that should, should look familiar to you, which is this, which is a tiling algorithm. Open MP parallel, open MP no wait, do the loop on the tiles in parallel on these threads. So this look like uh, old fashioned uh, old fashioned um, parallel uh, implementation, and it is, and it works well. So why change it? This is also the ability you can put the stuff, you can isolate this thing somewhere and do whatever you want to it. You want to write assembly code here, you can do it. It's if you are the responsible for that backend for that software component, as long as you respect the rules and you, and you implement the functionality, it doesn't matter what you do. It's better if you do it nicely, so then it's easier to maintain, and etc. But if you really want, you can do as dirty as you want. Well, this is not particularly dirty, but still, it's OpenMP, and you know, as a C++ guy would say, why not using stud threads? Well, because this is also C++03. So we don't have threads in C++03. Okay. <coughs> okay, so let's go back to the presentation. I think we're done here. Uh, I will go back, I will come back to the to the grid tools uh, uh, shortly uh, because I want to show you another another feature and how you do certain things. Um, so we have two backends, and uh, we have to provide the same API to intermediate layers. So the two backends have the same thing. The, the call to them is exactly the same. Uh, just change the type of it. And some, uh, Joshua Block is a, is a Java guy. He wrote the Java books on how to program Java. Uh, and uh, I'd like to mention him here uh, because he's a Java guy. He's a, I'm... I'm Embracing diversity and, and and say API can be one of your greatest assets or liabilities. An API usually outlive your code. They, they, they can they, they will outlive your work in some sense. If they're good, the better. You don't want as uh, uh, I think Scott Mayer says, uh, you don't want to be known in 20 years because you designed a bad a bad API. You want to be known because you design a good one. And all programmers are API designers. And I'm really, I mean, trying to get this message. <laughs>